cows are awesome. <laughs> no, seriously. If you're a family in the developing world, a cow's a fantastic asset. The milk's nutritious, you can sell it in the market for additional income, and the manure is great for farming. So a couple of years ago, I was serving as Nepal's youth ambassador to the United Nations, and one of the delegates told me a fascinating story. A Dutch NGO figured out how awesome cows are and decided to give a bunch to Indian villages to help them out. Sounds like a pretty good idea. When they came back a year later, they found a disaster unfolding. You see, what had happened was a bunch of the villagers took their girl child out of school to look after the cows. There's now a generation of girls in these villages without an education. The more important story for me is how good intentions, the very best of intentions, can lead to disaster. The military has a term for this. It's called friendly fire, where in the heat of battle, in the confusion that ensues, you end up shooting people you care about. And I'm going to argue to you today that foreign aid is friendly fire, that despite our best intentions, we're spending billions of dollars that are hurting people. And perhaps we need to redesign the way we spend this money. But before I tell you what my argument is, it's really important for me to tell you what it's not. Because you see, there's a little bit of a cottage industry of people arguing against aid. And the sorts of arguments they make is, aid is ineffective because of waste and poor planning. And they're sort of right. Here's an example. So the Times newspaper here in the UK ran this story where they found out that this think tank IIED charged DFID, the UK aid agency, $12,700 for one blog post. That's waste. If you want to talk about poor planning, DFID again decided to build an airport in St. Helena, and after having spent $350 million building it, realized that you can't actually land aircraft there. You see, they forgot to check for wind shear, which is a sudden change in the wind direction and speed that makes airports pretty much useless. So there is waste, there is poor planning, but I think my argument actually goes further. Why? You see, because these arguments just say aid is ineffective. I'm going to argue today that aid is counterproductive. You're not just wasting, you're actively hurting people that you want to help. The other reason why my argument is different is the cause. The cause here is waste and poor planning. And to be honest, I don't quite buy it. Because if waste and poor planning is all that's wrong, you need to cut the waste and plan better. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The argument I'm going to make to you today is that aid does not work because of human nature. The problem runs deeper. So what do I mean by this? See, I'm going to show you a lot of academic evidence, experiments I've run in Nepal, a lot of other studies that prove the point. But at its essence, the idea is really simple. People care about what they pay for. Imagine going out for dinner. The more expensive the restaurant, the better the service you expect, the better the food. We calibrate things based on what we pay for. Foreign aid grants to governments are free. And my simple contention to you is that people care less about governments that are funded by foreign money simply because it's free. The idea is what foreign aid and a lack of taxation structures around the world is doing is it's switching off accountability demand. People don't care as much as they should. My road to this realization started with trips to Nepal. So I go back home to Nepal quite often, and every time I'm in Nepal, the most puzzling thing for me is why people aren't more pissed off. No, seriously. Pick up the paper and the number of corruption cases you read about is astonishing. And then you talk to people and they seem to sort of be, yeah, this is what's going on. And you know, so it really puzzles me. Just to give you an illustration, this isn't just a Nepal problem, right? This is across the developing world, there's a lot of corruption. Meet Mr. Jacob Zuma. He's the president of South Africa. You know, he decided to spend 16 million US dollars to do security updates to his house. And then some people went to check out what these security updates were, and they noticed a swanky new swimming pool. So I imagine the conversation went something like, 
um, Mr. President, there's a um, swimming pool. And Mr. Zuma, with a straight face, said to them, it's a fire protection device. <laughs> I mean, so on the face of corruption like this, how do you not get mad, right? So this really puzzled me. And the answer I kept getting back from people was, it's not my money. I don't pay taxes. Foreign aid is funding this. Why should I care? This actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you look around, there are a couple of people now in the audience who are very confused. Those are the economists, right? Because in economics, what we're taught is that money is fungible. Money is just a store of value. So if you take this brand new dollar bill, or if you take this crumpled old dollar bill and you walk into a dollar store, you're gonna get something equally useless. You shouldn't make a distinction, right? It's the same thing. So it turns out, though, behavioral economics teaches us we don't think this way. Now, it's a little too close to the American elections for me to provide evidence of human irrationality, but <laughs> turns out what goes on is this. We make accounts in our heads, mental accounts. And based on where money is coming from, we put money into these different accounts. And what studies have shown is that, say you win a lottery, you're going to put that money not into this big bracket called money, but into a smaller bracket called lottery money, and you're going to splurge. You're going to spend that money in a way that's very distinct from your hard-earned income. Why are we humans so irrational? Turns out evolution is partly to blame. So there's this idea called loss aversion, which means that we are designed to care more about losses than gains. Losses hurt us more than the pleasure from gain. There's a super cool experiment run by two professors at the University of Toronto in Chicago that illustrates this. So these professors, they went to a factory in China and they said, an electronics factory, and they said, we're gonna give you an 80 yuan bonus. Now they rolled out the bonuses in a different way. To half the workers, they said, we're gonna give you an 80 yuan bonus, and if you don't make us, say, 10 extra calculators, we're gonna take it back. To the other half, they said, make us 10 extra calculators and we'll give you this bonus. Same 80 yuan. And yet, what they found is that the group that we're told, you already have this money, but we're gonna take it back, worked a lot harder. They didn't wanna lose. The other group was dealing with gain. We make this distinction in our minds. And this is where taxes and aid go their separate ways. Tax income for us represents loss. It represents going to work every day. It represents looking at your boss's face every day. Right? Aid income is coming from abroad, and it doesn't represent those things. And therefore, people don't care as much. So all right, so there was this theoretical framework. All right, this might be an idea. I decided to go do some experiments in Nepal to check if this is true. I ran six experiments. Fortunately for you, I only have time to show you one of them. But here's what I did. So I showed people this article that talks about corruption in Nepal. A politician in Nepal has stolen money. Right? Now, there's only one difference in these articles. So the article on the right talks about the money coming from foreign aid. The article on the left says the money came from taxes. That is the only distinction. The corruption case, the amounts involved, everything else is the same. I then asked Nepalis, how angry are you about this corruption case? Do you want to punish this bloke? And if you do, how long do you want to send him to jail? The results bear out the theory. The blue here represents the people who read the tax story. And what you find is they are a lot more pissed off. They want this bloke punished, and they want to send him to jail for a longer time. Across the board, people felt the pain when it was tax money involved in a much bigger way than when foreign aid was involved. Now, I also wanted to triangulate, use other methods to see if this is what happens, and so I had about 500 Nepalese respondents fill out these forms. I said, all right, you've read these articles, now tell me how you feel. And then I ran content analysis on this, and again, what you find is that the people who read that tax story use adjectives more, they're just generally more pissed off, right? The third piece of evidence is cross-national analysis, and this makes it really interesting because this takes us out of the developing world context and into the developed world context. So, one of the things I wanted to check was, in the United States, there are some states like New Hampshire, where I lived, that don't have income tax. 
right? Now, Montana has income tax. I wanted to see, do Montanans and New Hampshire people demand different levels of accountability from their government simply because they're paying taxes or not? Or are they aware of more taxes or not? And what I find is that they do, right? And so the finding here is that taxes make you demand accountability, and when you get free money, it switches off accountability demand. And fortunately for you, you don't have to take my word for it. There are other scholars who found the same thing when it comes to oil income, and they've also done ethnographic studies. There is now an increasing literature that foreign aid might have a negative impact on accountability demand. All right, so what's next? Am I here to tell you to go home and write to your MPs saying, cut the aid? Absolutely not. That would be disastrous. If you look at the stories coming to us today from Syria, from across the world, the UNHCR needs more money, not less. There are emergency interventions that we need to fund a lot more. My findings are only related to development aid. And even there, what I'm suggesting is not cutting the funding, it's redesigning the funding. We need to work with human nature, realize how human incentives work, and build our aid programs around that rather than working against it. So what's the answer? This is going to make me really popular here. Taxes. In fact, more taxes, right? So I mean two things by this. One, a lot of developing countries have a really small tax base. Tax penetration is really low. If you can help these countries expand their tax base such that more citizens are paying taxes, these citizens are going to start demanding more from their government. The second thing, though, is a lot of these citizens are incredibly poor, people living on less than $2 a day. So am I suggesting you go tax them more? No, of course not. But poor people pay a lot of taxes. If you look at indirect taxes, sales taxes, and the percentage of their income that's spent on these commodities, poor people pay a lot of taxes. And so the second approach is to just make people realize how much taxes they already pay. What difference do I think this is going to make? Well, it's going to engineer entitlement. When that person then goes to the hospital in Nepal and is asked for a bribe, he or she can say, no, I won't pay this because guess what? Your salary comes from my taxes. This idea of accountability, of engineering entitlement, is what I think will lead to sustainable development. So again, the takeaway from my talk to you is this. Foreign aid and a lack of tax structures has made people switch off accountability demands, and it's hurting development. By redesigning aid in a way that helps expand these tax structures, by making people demand accountability from their governments, we can spark an accountability revolution that will lead to real development. Thank you.